Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum in Heritage Park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. On today's episode, Scott sits down with Rusty Robinson, the owner of Rusty's TV and Car Museum in Jackson, Tennessee. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South and... Just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, Tennessee, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. The Transportation Gallery at Discovery Park of America is one of our most popular galleries, so I know a lot of people like cars, and even more people love TV and movies. Today's guest is someone who liked all three enough that he created a whole TV and movie car museum in Jackson, Tennessee called Rusty's TV and Movie Car Museum. Rusty Robinson is here with me today, and I cannot wait to talk to you well, about, some, about cars. Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for, for asking me to do this. You bet. So let's, let's, let's start with Little Rusty. So okay. <laughs> decades ago, you were a little kid who loved cars. Loved cars. Just, uh, I mean, my mom's got, like, bulletins from church where if I'm four years old drawing cars on the back of them. I get, it's just something that's, I guess, just in you from the beginning, you know, eight o'clock on Friday night, Duke's Hazard come on. And that's another thing that like, if you ask somebody from my age group, you know, that's what they were doing on Friday night at eight o'clock was watching Duke's Hazard. So that's a big, and every other TV show, the car was as big of a star as the actors the general league got more fan mail than the, any of the actors put together yeah i'm a little older than you so i think my first movie car would have been herbie the love bug yeah, herbie the love bug uh there's a you know and, and like back then you know they played such a big part in and watching something like that you know or seeing one of the cars people say it takes them back to their childhood so that's you know and then every generation now the fast and the furious it's probably one of the biggest which it is Universal's biggest franchise. It's in the billions of dollars now. So, and I'm lucky to have three of those original cars. So what? So you're a little kid. You love cars. You start to grow up. Um, I know for me, my first um, car was a great big gigantic <laughs> orange Ford truck. For some reason, um, what what was your first car that you you bought? The first thing that I really had was my dad got stuck in the snow one time, and he and he was. He was a little tight, you know, but he'd got stuck in the snow and he had a two wheel drive truck. And he said, if I do anything, I'm going to buy me a four wheel drive. He said, I want to smell the paint, burn off the engine just one time on something. <laughs> That's what he said. So he went out and bought him a brand new four wheel drive. And one right before I was probably around 14 or so, he said he was then about wore the truck out and he said he was going to get him something else and I could have that four wheel drive. So I took it and paint. Fixed it up, painted it, got the seat fixed, you know. And at that time, he said, I sure would like to have my truck back. After I got it looking good, I said, well, I'll tell you what. If you find me a Mustang, I'll trade you. And so, sure enough, he found the 66 Mustang and, and uh, went out and looked at it and ended up buying it. And, and I still have that car. I still got the four-wheel drive truck, but I still got my first. That's the one I drove, started high school and everything, was a 66 Mustang. And it was a cool car, and I, there are stories about my dad and cars. If you want to hear a car story about like that, uh, it was just a six cylinder, and it it was just it was kind of rough old car, still kind of rough old car. And uh, it was the night of the bonfire at Southside High School, and and there were across the road from Southside where the Sonic is, and it used to be a Southgate shopping center. There was a grocery store, and so. After the bonfire, I went down there. A lot of people, I guess, hang out in a little spot there. And my, it caught on fire. And, I mean, it was, like, blazing. <laughs> and, and the guy from 
the the grocery store come out and he put it out and all them guys they were just hammering me they called it everything you could think of <laughs> you should just let that piece of crap burn you know and my dad pulled up and he was listening to him you know and i was really down and out and hauled my car back home and <laughs> worked on it for several weeks and you know i was like doing it myself patching it because the wires would burn off of it and and I was getting right ready, you know, to go out because I was tired of sitting around the house. And it was a Saturday night. My dad, he done plumbing work, too. And he said, he said, would you help me for a little while, you know? And I said, yeah, I'll go help you. I'm getting in my car, you know, might as well. And so we went to this house. And, man, it was the sharpest Mustang GT you could think of sitting in the front yard. And uh, he said, I'm going to go in and see what we need, you know, to do the job. And I said, okay. And he come back outside. He said, you like that car? I said, oh, man, that thing is sharp. He said, it's yours. Wow. And, man, you talking about revenge because <laughs> it, it was it was fast. It had it had stuff done to it. And, and That's man, amazing. I, I let the, those guys that was giving me a hard time, I let them have it a little bit. Yeah, they say success <laughs> is the best revenge. <laughs> yeah. So you pulled and it up so, successful. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, the coolest guy at that time, or the, he had an IROC Z. You probably remember those. You know, yeah. My personalized tag said DIROC on the back of them. <laughs> so I let them have That's it a little amazing. bit. <laughs> so, so you're today... Let's fast forward to today, and then we'll talk about how you got here. Tell me a little bit about Rusty's TV and Movie Car Museum. Uh, I had a lot of this stuff at my house. I had a General Lee years ago, and, you know, I figured out real fast that uh, there could be a $500,000 Ferrari sitting there, and they would walk past it to see that orange charger, you know, so uh, I, I could tell the attraction to that type of stuff early and so i just got one got another one and it, it started out as car clubs wanting to come out to the house and look at the stuff and you know having picnics and and so i thought well why not try to get them where people could because one day i was just sitting there working on something this bmw pulls up with out-of-state tags and i they said uh are you the guy with all the movie cars you know and i said yeah and they said, can we look? And I said, sure, you know, and I showed them around. And I said, Hi. you could, it was kind of the beginning of internet boards and stuff. And they had just searched it out and found me, you know. And I thought, well, if people that are that interesting, I'd like to have. And so I started looking, found the building and fixed it up. It's been about 10 years ago, been open about 10 years. And uh, put them where people could actually stop and look at the cars, you know. So you found, I noticed, um, I noticed on Facebook you posted uh, a note, I'm assuming is from your teacher when you were little, that said (laughs) Rusty could do better work if he would quit playing. Yeah. (laughs) But you actually found a way to both work and play all at the same time. What are are some of the cars that you have in the museum? Uh, And I had to swap out right now. I just uh, got the the building next door, so I'll be able to span the put most of the cars I have in there but so and it's an it's an old Wonder Bread building. Yeah, it was built for Wonder Bread uh in the 50s uh and it's a really cool art deco. I like round I like that style building, you know, it was it was really cool and that that was an attraction to me, but as far as the cars in there, I've got your I always keep your basics, you know, the Batmobile, uh Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Fast and Furious. Uh, over probably over half of them are the screen used cars uh like I said, the Fast and I, I got really lucky. I've got Paul Walker's. I got three of his cars, but I've got the very first car that he drove in in the Fast and Furious series. I got his Green Eclipse, and that's probably one of the bigger draws. And I, I just got is I searched the car out. I probably had that car mm, probably twelve years, and uh, once he got killed in that car wreck, I've had every museum you could think of want to buy it, you know, but. I know if it ever left, I'd never get it back. So it's a really cool car, and I've got a Skyline from the fourth movie, and I've got another car of his from the first movie too. But it's the green screen car. It was made for when he sat in it. Uh, they could bolt it to. It was called a McRig to film him driving and film green screen scenes. So he probably sat in that car more than he sat in anything. But it's 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 a called a buck, a process buck, you know. And I got it. It's not in the museum, but I thought it would, you know, that's when I get more room, it'd be really cool for people to actually see how something's filmed, you know. Oh, yeah. What about, uh, do you have any of the artifacts that go with the cars? That, I've got, you know? uh, as far as Ghostbusters, I've got 
there's hard to get anything from the ghost, the early Ghostbusters. I got a, a Ecto one replica because Sony never sold the real car. They still have it. But far as artifacts, I've got the manhole cover when the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man walks down the street. The manhole. <laughs> I got one of the manhole covers. Yeah. Uh, one of the only things I've ever had stolen from me is man. It's just so. It, and I think it happened at my house rather than at the museum. I had, if you're familiar with Ghostbuster, I had the original sketch of Lord Vigo, and uh, and it it come up missing. But oh wow, uh, it's re- it was a really cool piece. Uh, I've got one of Kurt Russell's jackets. I've got uh, from the Green Hornet. I got Christoph Waltz's red suit from that movie. I've got Ice Cube's L.A. Raiders hat from Straight Outta Compton. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, I've got lots of like props too, you know. Yeah. Uh, Gremlins, uh, Pee Wee Herman. I've got I got a bike. I've got I've got some bicycles from a movie called Rad. It's a really cool eighties movie. Just You've a got lot. The, I, I remember the Beverly Hillbillies uh, truck. Yeah, I've got you know I've got it, and it's a replica. And if anybody, I always tell them if you want to see the real truck, it's at the Ralph Foster Museum. It's the Museum of the Ozarks. Mm. Uh, it's a college run museum, and that car was given to them when the show they thought there's only one too they thought ah, we're just trying to get rid of stuff back when that like late 60s 70s it's probably worth more than the town it's sitting in now because there's just one <laughs> yeah. one one truck it probably is and and so now and that george barris just seen it sitting on the side of the road and said that looks good for what we're filming it, it wouldn't planned or anything you know that's just that that truck was sitting on the side of the road it looked yeah. that bad what um so you you um have visitors obviously from all over the world what what's the what's the farthest away visitor you've had I, I've had I've had I've had every place you can think of I guess I guess Australia that's the furthest one you say yeah and yeah. I get I get a lot of Australians a lot of them yeah they love American music yeah, and, and of course and, we're and, on the and they American love, music and believe, trail. It, believe it or not they love car. over there if you if you search man they love cars in Australia. I get, I got a lot of, I went, when, before I opened the music, I got an Australian Falcon, an XBGT that's, if you watch the Mad Max movies, that's what Mad Max drives. Mm-hmm. And so years ago, I bought this XBGT because I don't know, it's probably less than maybe, I don't know. There's not very many, many in the States. I'd say less than 10 XBGTs. And that is their cream of the crop muscle car. I didn't know at the time I was wanting to build a Mad Max car. And uh, it, before Facebook and all this, there was message boards and I put on there, I want a kit to turn this car into a Mad Max replica. And I've never in my life got so much hate. <laughs> People were like, I can't remember all the bad stuff they wished death on me because i was going to do this but they take it very seriously yeah. there and i've gotten several australian tv shows come to the museum and film car a car show wow that's yeah, incredible really cool so it's, it's so obviously your idea has been very successful and mm-hmm. it's been it's a part of your life now what what is it like to be um running a business in a rural you know jackson's not rural obviously but we're not the heartbeat of you know of the, any the we're not lo- a major metropolitan the city lucky part of being in jackson tennessee is they're going from Na- they're landing in nashville or they're landing in memphis and they're going between they're renting a car and they're going to one or the other when they walk through the door and they're not from here i, I say you headed to memphis or nashville that's what comes out of my mouth because yeah. more likely that's what they're doing and so i'm lucky that people say you know why right there, which is five minutes from my house, is one reason it's right there. And and Jackson, downtown Jackson right now is really, they're trying to, to change it, you know, the lift and everything. And if you walk out of my front door and walk over a block, you're to the edge of where they're re- revitalizing, you know, Lambeth campus and everything. So I'm, I think eventually it's going to come and, you know, take in Hollywood Drive, but it's straight to the interstate. You get off on the exit 79, it's three miles right to my front door. You don't have to make a turn. I'm lucky of that too. And if when I first done it, I mean, I'm not trying to. It was somebody from uh, I think Graceland at the time that was on a tour. I said, I worry about you know, you know, they're fixing up. And she goes, You ever drove down to Graceland? You know, this is you know, don't worry. You know, if they want to see you, they're going to come see you. So and it's. Eventually, it's picking up a little at a time, you know. Yeah, I was going to ask you: Are you seeing growth in yeah, your yeah. in your number uh, of visitors? And, the, and it and 
that I have no, this is all out of, out of my pocket. This is no, this is no government grants. This is no anything. This is, and so my advertising is TripAdvisor, Road Trippers, Roadside America. But, uh, you know, this past weekend I had, it's nothing compared to big ones, but if you ask some of the smaller ones, like 200 people, you know, and I'm just open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, uh, that's a, for this time of year, you know, still cold and everything until vacation, you know, that's, that's a good number for me. Are you looking to expand in, in the summertime? Are you open yeah, more? Uh, well, I would love to, but it's just, this is a hobby and love, you know, uh, if I had help, yeah, you know, maybe, and I, I've looked into maybe some volunteers or something, but it's hard. I want everybody to have a, the, a good experience. You know, I look on TripAdvisor and people I think enjoy talking about the stuff as much as they seeing it. And I try to give a tour to every, every group that comes through, every family that comes through me or my, my cousin that helps me tries to give them a tour, you know, and tell them about each car. Yeah, I came through years ago, and it's it's and hard. It's hard, you know. It's amazing, but so that that's that's one of the selling points of the museum is people like to that personal touch, you know. So being small, it's not bad because it seems like they take more from it. You know, you can give right. a, give them a little piece of you, you know, too. You're putting on a show for them. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is I think uh, the the thing that you have going for you is the uniqueness, you mm -hmm. know, and the the personal touch. And it's just, it's an experience that you can't get anywhere else in the and, world. And just like Discover Park of America, uh, it's not on I-40. I'm not, you know, people say, why here? I say, well, if they come to me, it's because they're interested and they want, they're interested in learning and they want to see it. You know, if I was sitting at Branson or Gatlinburg, it's just something Hey, let's walk through here. There's something new. They're coming because they want to, and it, it's a different. You're getting a different kind of customer. It's because they want to be there. They want to learn. They want to see it. You know, they're really interested. It's not like dragging their feet walking through just just to waste time. You know, so that's it's a different type of customer you're getting in that kind of spot. You know. So what what car got away? What car did you uh, almost get? Uh, I, and there's been. Probably one of the worst mistakes I made is uh, Vin Diesel's Black Charger from Bass and Furious. I could have bought bought one of those and just stupid for not doing it now. Looking back, golly. But at that time, I didn't have the museum. It was just a hobby, you know, of I had the green eclipse, so I thought, ah. But it's a good one. That's a really, you know, good car to have if you had it. It's a draw. You know, any of the Fast and Furious stuff, early stuff, I got really, really lucky getting the cars I got. Just, I was just, nowadays, it's it's hard to get it unless you want to really pay, you know. What, um, what cars do you have your eyes on? What what do you hope you get? I would love to have a Gone in 60 Seconds Eleanor, you know. Uh, I try to get stuff that you don't have to, people ask what you want. I try to get stuff that you don't have to explain. That's in the movie car business, some of these other museums, you know, they and people trying to sell you stuff, or people call. I get people call and try to sell me stuff all the time, <clears throat> and it's you want the things that you don't have to say what it is, you know. When they look at it, you know, and not everybody's going to know like all the cars in my museum, but you get certain people that's their favorite. Or this one over, here. Quentin Tarantino fans, they like this car, you know. So, but. When they see it, you know, I know right then that they know what it is, and that's what I kind of go for. But I would love to have a family truckster from vacation. <laughs> um, just a, there's a few that I would like to have, but, you know, it's that, like that Gone in 60 Seconds Mustang. You're not, you know, when it come out the movie theater, it wasn't the biggest hit but for, among car people it was. But, man, the the effect that that movie, you wouldn't believe the effect that movie has on prices. To this day, that movie is probably 2000, a pile of crap, 67 or 68 Mustang Fastback, because that movie is going to cost you $10,000 for just a pile of junk because of that movie right now. Uh, so you've got, you've, got, you've, got your, you've got your museum and you've got cars <laughs> stored somewhere else I've got, I've, I've waiting. Got a, I've, got a, I've probably got about 20 or 30 more movie TV cars, and i got just a bunch of old stuff too. i got probably another... 20 or 
30 just old cars. Man, yeah. you, you, you love cars, right? Uh, it's a mental yeah. a mental disorder. <laughs> what I, literally. That's amazing. You're like Jay Leno. It was, and my dad, you know, and, and for one thing I want to make for sure that if you don't get anything out of this podcast, none of this would be possible without my parents. My dad, my mom, you know, my dad passed away in 07, but none of it. Every bit of it is because of them, because of my dad was, my mom, my dad was smart, way ahead of his time, didn't graduate eighth grade education, but, but just smart. And he couldn't have done it without my mom. He couldn't have done what he done if she wasn't here helping him, supporting him. And what'd he do for a living? Uh, he, he had a plum company, but rental property was just, you know, he was just so far ahead of. You know, you see all these TV shows now, but he he was, you know, now you see every on every corner, I buy timber. Well, dad was buying the the farms, selling the timber, getting the farm for free and the houses, you know, Mm. by the time he sold the timber off of them. But he was just way ahead. He was an early entrepreneur, a a rural entrepreneur. And uh, and he didn't, you know, he wanted to like, um, as far as dealing in rental property, he wanted the stuff that was in communities and he wanted houses. He didn't want apartments. He didn't want duplexes. He didn't want, he wanted where a kid could pull up in a school bus and get off. And he, it was his home. It wasn't a stepping stone, you know? So he was, you know, just way ahead of his, uh, all that. So, and, and, and none of that would have none of this museum without that, without him. And he loved cars too. And then it like, just like the story about him, get me the Mustang. He, he didn't like, you, you know, he would work me to death, you know, getting, if I had a choice of riding a school bus home and getting home and, and getting out of school at three thirty and maybe getting home by five o'clock, or him picking me up and me working my way home, so <laughs> and you'd get home about the same time. But but he loved to work. I mean, he loved to work. So yeah, that's amazing. What a legacy he left behind. He was uh, really and you know nobody. I've never heard anybody say anything. You know, he just he didn't care what pay grade you was, you know, or anything. If you've seen him, you probably didn't think he had two nickels to rub together. If you've seen him walking around, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's just, just him, you know, he just, just a good guy. And he, did he live long enough to see the museum? No, and- he, 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 he was there for, cause the, the, at the house, we've got like a old town, kind of like y'all's deal. You know, it looks like the fronts look like old, like an old Western town, but inside are, are garages. And he was there for like we had we had lots we had hundreds of people would come you know just open it up to the public every once in a while or have car and he was there for all that you know and I tell the story you know uh, he was a uh, a guy come up to me and he said uh, he said I met your da- I was check reading the meters you know on the buildings and I said is there cars in here and he said your dad took me through there and. You know, and told me about everything, and you know, he said I really enjoyed that. I said he got as much enjoyment doing that as you did. I promise you. You know, you know, that's incredible. And so now you do the same thing with guests who come here. I I can tell that, and from what I've heard, you enjoy the people coming yeah, to see that, your cars. And you get to meet so many different. And I'll tell you, I, I got a couple of funny stories about the museum. But this past weekend, I told the guy when he come through the door. He was from Slovenia. He was drinking a beer. Mm-hmm. He come in like just full blown. He, he was smelling pretty, but he was drinking a beer. I said, you are the first person to ever walk in this business drinking a beer. I just want to tell you that. <laughs> did he enjoy his tour? Oh, he did. They were, and you know, like you said, a lot of these foreign countries, they love American cars. You know, you know, it's a, it's just a big, and the car, a, a car is like a, your key to freedom when you're 16. You know, I guess, you know, I, it affects people. Some people don't understand. I say, hey, you look, there's TV channels dedicated to cars. I mean, you know, there's you can't hardly turn the TV on without something to do with a car, you know. It's a big part of people's lives. Well, movies and entertainment, too. And International and movies folks, they and, love yeah. American oh, yeah. entertainment. I bet you're fun to watch uh, movies with. You yeah, you spot yeah. all the oh, yeah. all the cars, all don't the, you? Well, well I, I love one-liners anyway, too. I was, I was talking about the, you know, having the NASCAR display, and I said, I only, Ricky Bobby... <laughs> Man, so many one-liners. Yeah. If you want to hear, I want to tell this a funny story about the museum in general. Yeah. And you might have heard this one, but I had this one guy. It seems like 
Jackson, Tennessee, that not only I think is a meeting place for online dating. <laughs> I can see when they pull up, you know, uh, it'll be two different counties or two different even states, and they'll get out and they'll talk, you know, and kind of hug or whatever and come in the door. And I say, y'all are on a, you know, dating. Yeah, yeah we're meeting halfway, you know. <laughs> and so I'd have this one guy, still have this one guy, that once a month or whatever, he'll come in and I had to pretend like I've never met him before. <laughs> he'll have a new new girlfriend or new girl and I have to pretend, you know. And so he'll come through the museum and then I'll see people doing the same thing. I say, I'll tell the story. I said, I got this one guy that comes with a different girl every two or three weeks or month, you know, and, and I had to pretend like I don't know him. And I said, but he's not, it's not him. <laughs> and then when they make the t- round and go out the front door, I'll say, I'll see you in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, so there's a whole other service you're providing <laughs> yeah. for the, the dating community oh, of yeah. West Tennessee that, <laughs> that we didn't even know about. You meet all kinds. Of, it's a really, you know, cool thing to meet different people. So if you weren't, if you weren't running a museum or real estate, what, what would you be doing? I don't know. I would probably still be working on cars. You know, I just love, I got me, I'm a hands-on, never, never, I wasn't a book like the report card you've seen. Uh, <laughs> I barely made it out alive. I think they felt sorry for me. <laughs> you remember social promotion? Yeah. That's when you're in the school with the, you've been in one class so long, you're getting too old to be around those kids. <laughs> and so they let you go into the next That's one. how you got out. That's, <laughs> That's great. how I got out. They, they felt the wimp. The, <laughs> hey, but I tell you what, that, the, <laughs> the the economics teacher she was she was hard on me. I failed. I failed the first. It was one of those six uh, semester classes. I got another one, and, <laughs> and so years later, I was. She called me. And she said, "Rusty, I've got water running all over my floor because my dad was a plumber." You know, I said, <laughs> she said, "Please come help me." I said, "You remember that elf you gave me?" <laughs> she goes, "Yeah, I didn't give you anything you didn't deserve." <laughs> I said, "I'll be there in a few minutes." You know? <laughs> You learned early. Uh, yeah. That's and, great. And, and I, another thing, I mean, and then there's like people that, that, that we need everybody, you know, you need people with trades and everything. And, and a lot of people gone from high school to college, but my Valley Victoria makes the best little Caesars pizza. There you go. That's exactly <laughs> right, man. Everybody's got to find their, got to find their place. Yeah. Um, so you're expanding. You said you're expanding further into the building that you're in. What, what's going to, what's the vision? Uh, just uh, to get everything, because I have people walk in and say, I want to see this car. And I said, well, it's not here right now. I've got it out, you know, so I'm going to try to have it where everybody will get to see the ones. Because sure enough, I'll have the one I'll take out is the, somebody walk in. I'm here to see Christine or the Fall Guy truck or something like that. And I said, well, it's or not Herbie. Here. You have Herbie. Herbie stay, Herbie's going to stay in there. The one I wish I got, Christine, I, I drive her, and that's the Stephen King movie. I got a car from Breaking Bad, and I get here lately. I've really got people wanting to see that car, so I'll be glad when I can have everything and not have to disappoint anybody, you know. And so you are located. I wanted to ask you, was it already called Hollywood Drive? Yep, it's okay. Hollywood Drive. So what a coincidence. I know, that and that you, was another thing, you know. Everybody said, that you're supposed to be there. And you know? your name is Rusty yep. and Cars. Yep. And so it's just, it's all fortuitous. <laughs> it was all meant to be. So Rusty is located at 323 Hollywood Drive in Jackson in the old Wonder Bread building. Um, thank you so much oh, for no um, being here with us yeah. today. Uh, you can check out more about Rusty's fascinating museum at Rusty's TV and Movie Cars dot com. That's right. Um, it's an incredible place if you're going to be anywhere near. And I bet there's a lot of people in Jackson who've never who've never visited. That's, uh, tourism uh, is a funny thing, you know. Your local town, you hardly, you know. I have people say, oh, I'm. I can't tell you when the last time I went to Casey Jones Village, you know, to the train museum. It's, it's, local people, it's just... That's right. It's hard to get locals to, hard to, to get locals visit. to do it. You know, most people I see, 90% of them are from somewhere else. Every, everybody needs to go visit Rusty's. I'm telling you, it's a fascinating place. And now to someone who discovers something new every single day, here's Katie Jarvis at Discovery Park of America. Thank you, Scott. And I have now David Heathcott, who is a docent here at Discovery Park of America. David, thank you for being on the podcast today. Uh, glad to be here. And you're going to tell us a little bit about the Titan One missile that we have on display. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, uh, we do have a, a Titan One missile on exhibit. It was a, what we called a free missile, except it cost us a lot of money because by the time uh, everybody that uh, that had dibs on it uh, decided they didn't want it, 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 it had deteriorated quite a bit. So it required quite a bit of... Uh, 
of uh, repair and repainting. But I basically want to tell the story about the missile and uh, talk about uh, uh, rocketry in general and then where the Titan One fits in and, uh, and a few other things. But uh, we have to go back to the Chinese to really get to the ground zero of, of rocketry. The Chinese were pretty much the uh, pioneers in rocketry, and, and they, they developed solid, solid fuels fire, for fireworks and for battle and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, if you move a little uh, forward a few, uh, few thousand years, then you, uh, you come to Robert Goddard. And Robert Goddard was a strong believer in liquid-fueled rockets. And he experimented uh, on his own dime. He, he already had a, a penny to spend, and he had lots of failures, but they learned from them. And then uh, when World War II broke out, Germany decided to build a, a medium-range ballistic missile. And the idea was to uh, bombard the British into, into surrender and inflict terror on their populace. And so the, uh, the Germans actually went and got some of Robert Goddard's patents and, and used them in development of the V-2. So Werner von Braun was the primary engineer in charge of this. And once again, they had lots of failures. And for, uh, fortunately for us, by the time that they actually got, them, got the V-2 to where it was very reliable, uh, the, war, the war had, uh, had proceeded to push the, them back out of range. So they weren't that useful anymore. But uh, uh, getting to the uh, uh, Titan I, uh, in the 1950s, basically the Americans and Russians were in a space race. And the Russians uh, succeeded in launching a satellite first, which was Sputnik, and that inflicted just absolute terror on the Americans because if you could launch a satellite, you could also launch a bomb. So the, uh, the American program uh, greatly accelerated, and uh, the Atlas missile was, a, or was going to be our primary uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, meaning it could, be, it could be fired from the North American continent and land, and land in, in the Soviet Union. But... Uh, it was uh, it was prone to failure, and so the the Titan I was uh, approved as a as a backup, and the Titan I uh, was going to be pioneering a lot of things that hadn't been tried before, multiple stages, uh, uh, and and very powerful liquid fuel rockets, and its uh, development was very tortured, and uh, it spent a long time uh, uh, having problems. Uh, uh, stages wouldn't separate, uh, upper stage engines wouldn't ignite. Uh, uh, rockets would go out of control and have to be destroyed in flight, and it was so bad that the that the Air Force actually thought that Martin uh, uh, Martin Aircraft was uh, not taking this very seriously. So they knuckled down on them, and by 1959, they they had it reliable enough that they could uh, actually deploy it in service. It had a range of of 5,500 nautical miles. That's 6,000 and some odd miles. It could, uh, uh, in theory, it could go from if you launched it in Nashville, it could land in Syria, and then. Uh, uh, one of its drawbacks that it had was it couldn't be it couldn't be stored fueled. It uh, it used liquid uh, liquid oxygen and uh, and kerosene and liquid oxygen uh, above a temperature of two hundred uh, minus two hundred ninety seven degrees, it would start to boil off into gaseous oxygen, and so you had to wait to to fuel it, and so they would raise it up in the uh, out of the silo and, and start loading the fuel in the oxidizer, and that took about a half hour. And the problem was that in that half hour, uh, Russian Russian missiles could be coming toward where it was and destroy it on the ground. Uh, it was just a stopgap. It, uh, it served until 1964. Our particular missile, the full serial number on it is uh, 6144-96, which meant it was built in 1961, the same year I was. I always remember how old it is by that. None of these were ever fired in anger, and uh, that, was, uh, that was what they were intended for. But it was eventually, uh, it was eventually replaced by a uh, a, uh, a successor called the Titan II, and the Titan II didn't have the problem with the liquid oxygen, but it had other problems in that uh, it used what was called a hypergolic fuel, which meant as soon as they combined, they ignited, and that was fine as long as they combined and ignited where they were supposed to. But uh, in 1980, a uh, Air Force technician dropped a socket from uh, almost to the top of a missile in a silo in Arkansas. It's about 100 and 104 miles from. Discovery Park as the crow flies. Unfortunately, the, the, the wayward socket punched a hole in a fuel tank. And this was very toxic fuel, very toxic, very corrosive. And uh, the missile actually depended on the pressure of the fuel tanks in order to keep its structural strength. And so uh, they didn't know what to do, and they, they eventually abandoned the silo. And, uh, and after several hours of venting fuel, the, uh, the missile collapsed in on itself, and the, the fuel and oxidizer combined, and there was a massive explosion which blew two 740-ton uh, blast doors 
uh, several hundred yards, and it also launched the, the warhead. And the warhead, thankfully, did not explode because the explosion was so violent that it, it destroyed the electronics that would have ignited it. And so a, a man was killed, and, and dozens were hurt. And, uh, and it, was a, uh, it was a very sobering lesson in the power of, uh, of uh, our uh, nuclear arsenal. Wow. Well, thank you so much, David, for all of this information and the history of it. Is there anything else you want to share about the Titan One missile? Well, um, it's uh, it's fortunate in that uh, it uh, ours survived by by just pure luck because it uh, it wasn't powerful enough to really launch a satellite. And uh, a lot of the Titan Twos, there's only one left now. They were uh, they were used to uh, launch uh, uh, Gemini capsules, which were manned capsules, and they were also uh, used to launch uh, lots of payloads. Uh, into orbit, but because the the Saturn one had what they called so little throw weight, it it they they just kind of slid them off to the side and forgot about them. There's still quite a few left out there, and that was how we got ours. It was just kind of discarded somewhere and until somebody wanted it, which was us. Do you know where we found the Titan one missile? I understand it was in the uh, in the back uh, the back field at uh, at the rocket center at Huntsville. I think that's right. I think that's what I've been told. So you must be right. Well, thank you again, David, for being here on the podcast. And I know I've learned a lot about the Titan One missile and people can come out to Discovery Park of America and you can launch the missile, if you will, and then also see a lot of different uh, military artifacts and also um, different NASA patches and things in our STEM landing. So again, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.